Robert Fico opakuje, že prezidentka je americká agentka a voľby ovplyvňuje George Soros. Naratív proti Spojeným štátom americkým stupňuje a pomáha im v tom aj republika a SNS. Ako sa na to pozera americký veľvyslanec a prečo sa vlastne po takýchto výrokoch s Robertom Ficom stretáva? A je ohrozená demokracia na Slovensku? Americký veľvyslanec na Slovensku. Gal tam? Rana. Welcome. Thank you very much. Dobrý deň. Ako sa máte? <laughs> Dobrý deň. Dobre. Thank you for uh, being here. How often do you meet with Slovak politicians? So let me begin by saying thank you very much, Susanna, for inviting me to your program. I'm honored to be here. And uh, Shetko <laughs> Thank you very much. All right, great. Um, I meet pretty regularly with Slovak politicians. That is the, one of the primary functions uh, that a U.S. ambassador has around the world. Uh, my goal here is to strengthen the relationship between Slovakia and the United States. That means meeting with uh, Slovaks across, um, across the spectrum political leaders, business leaders. I love meeting with students, uh, talking with media personalities like yourself, but a, a central, essential part of that is politicians. Why did you meet with Mr. Fito at all? Um, don't you consider him as an extremist? Because his recent quotes could be uh, extremist, right? Could be considered extremist. You know, again, as a U.S. ambassador, we meet with people across the political spectrum uh, around the world. Uh, Mr. Fico is a three-time former prime minister. Uh, he is currently uh, the leader in the polls, and uh, there might be a possibility that he could either be the prime minister in the future or be a member, prominent member of the government. I leave that decision to the Slovak people. You all will decide who your leaders will be. But Slovakia is a member of NATO. It's a member. It's a, a important member of the EU and thus for the United States we're going to have to have and we will have a strong relationship with uh, Slovakia. Having said that, uh, I do feel that some of his recent remarks, uh, particularly calling President Chaputova an American agent, uh, is uh, is completely inappropriate. Uh, and I think as a three-time prime minister, as someone who um, worked very closely with the United States when he was in power, uh, he knows better. Do you have any red lines? Like, what kind of quotes um, is like unacceptable, anti-Semitic, racist? Mm -hmm. Do you have any any red lines? Oh, we do. We definitely have red lines. And uh, so, for example, I won't meet with anyone who um, takes a neo-Nazi uh, viewpoint of uh, people who are denying the Holocaust. Um, that those are very very strong red lines. Um, but again, one of the things. Uh, you know, based on your question, is that it, it will be the Slovak people who will decide your next government, who will decide your next leaders. And as the American ambassador, um, I will have to work with your government, the people that you select. Well, that was But my next question, yeah. yeah. So what if, like, um, uh, right extremists mm -hmm. were in the government and they are denying the Holocaust, would you meet with them? Milan Uhrik, yeah. for example, from Republika? You know, that's a hypothetical, and I'll save that for the future, but I have noted what our red lines are. If you're a Holocaust denier, uh, we're, we're going to have to, uh, you know, I, you're, you're going to have to walk that back. I think at this point in time, you can't be denying the Holocaust in 2023. If you're anti-Semitic, um, you know, but I, I don't want to sit here and say these are red lines, these aren't red lines. I think it's very, it's very easy to, for me to say red lines right now, and we're going to hold to them, but I don't want to get into the world of hypotheticals. What's a red line? What's not a red line? Yeah. Um, one thing is what Robert Fito says uh, to his voters. Uh, another thing is what he would do uh, if he actually came uh, to power. Uh, do you believe that if Smer won, they would change Slovakia's foreign policy direction? I think, so again, We, I have to emphasize again, this is going to be a decision that uh, Slovak voters are going to have to make. Uh, what can Mr. Fico, if he were to come into power, what can he do? It's a very good question, right? Uh, if you were the prime minister, if you were a member of uh, parliament, I, I don't know. I can't speak for Mr. Fico, so you'd have to ask him yourself. What I do know is this. In 2004, Slovakia joined NATO. Slovakia joined the European Union. Slovakia chose to be part of the West. It did not choose to be part uh, and, and any sort of alliance with Moscow. If you look to the future, Slovak, it is, it's going to be much better for Slovakia to continue being with the West. Moscow offers 
nothing. And I think anyone who chooses to walk away from the West, I, I think would be it would be a disastrous, disastrous decision. I don't think the Slovak people would agree, and nor would the Slovak uh, political spectrum. Every single political party, I believe, um, has come out and said uh, that they want to remain major party, has, uh, uh, that Slovakia must remain a part of NATO and must remain a part of the, the European Union. And so I think it would be very hard to deviate from a pro-West foreign policy. Hmm. NATO launched recently an information com campaign to explain why Ukraine matters. Uh, is it good that they backed down in Slovakia, even though it had nothing to do with the upcoming elections? You know, so I leave that to NATO. Uh, again, I can't really speak about what they were trying to do. The NATO is an alliance and here. But I think it's absolutely clear that, yes, it's extremely important that the West and Slovakia continue supporting Ukraine. I don't think anyone in Slovakia wants Ukraine to lose because that would mean Russian soldiers on your borders again. And I think that's an existential threat to Slovakia. And I think people understand this across the political spectrum. Do you think so? Absolutely. I, I do. Um, now, um, again, I can't say what rhetoric people might be saying, but I think absolutely. Otherwise, Slovakia uh, wouldn't have joined NATO in 2004. And again, I think maybe the heart of your question is, what about Mr. Fico? Well, again, he was prime minister three times, and he was a strong supporter of NATO. Uh, he supported uh, uh, NATO operations in Afghanistan. Uh, he took in um, uh, detainees from Guantanamo. He visited President Obama at the White House. Uh, he began the negotiations for the Defense Cooperation Agreement, which we ultimately signed in 2021. He began negotiations, which uh, Prime Minister Pellegrini completed on the $1.8 billion F-16 deal. So I think Mr. Fizzo understands the importance of NATO. I, I know Smear absolutely does, uh, because we can look at what they did in the past. Uh, and across the political spectrum, political parties have repeatedly said they will support NATO, they will support the EU, and I think there's strong support for ensuring a Ukraine victory. I do respect that you're a diplomat, but I have to ask uh, several questions sure. about the U.S. politics as well. So do you see any similarities between politicians like Robert Fico, Igor Matovich, Boris Johnson, and Donald Trump? Well, you know, again, I think um, uh, I, I am a diplomat, and for me, uh, what's most important is, again, policy inclinations. I think the United States, what we have is strong bipartisan support for Ukraine, and that's going to continue. There's strong bipartisan support for NATO, uh, for our EU partners. In terms of the politics and, you know, personalities of politicians, um, we've always had, I think, a wide range of uh you know, political personalities, you know, that's just part of politics. Well, because it seems that if the USA were to have Trump as president again, mm -hmm. who spoke nonsense on a daily basis during COVID, encouraged his top health officials to study the injection of bleach uh, into the human body as a means of fighting COVID, it seems that um, if the USA would again have Mr. Trump as a president, some people might say that you should practice what you preach and your words will not carry um, that much weight. Robert Fico has even intensified it, saying every day that um, uh, we, we shall see what America is doing and what America did in Iraq or Afghanistan. So uh, shouldn't you practice what you preach in your politics? Uh, I think we do. And uh, I think uh, uh, I, I think we absolutely do. Uh, again, you know, the election of Donald Trump, what he might do is a hypothetical. One of the things I would point to is what did Donald Trump do when he was president? He actually helped strengthen the NATO alliance. Uh, I, I was working in Slovenia at the time uh, from 2016 to 2019. And one of the things that I saw was that he was very serious about NATO allies increasing um, their military expenditures up to two Something which Slovakia has done here, President Chaputova, other prominent politicians have said, hey, this is a good thing. We need to continue doing it going into the future. And Donald Trump really emphasized this. And he made, I think, the European allies take a strong look at this to strengthen the alliance, sit there and say that we have to work together. He also provided significant aid to Ukraine while as president. And I would, I would also note is that there's bi strong bipartisan support for Ukraine across the political spectrum. And I think particularly, you know, what, I need, what I'm talking about here is our foreign policy, right? 
I just had four um, Republican senators uh, and a member of uh, the House of Representatives. Uh, they came to Slovakia last week. Uh, we had very good conversations about Ukraine and the importance of Ukraine, the importance of Slovakia's role in it. When Senator Mitch McConnell, who is the head of the Republican Party in the Senate, he came to the Munich Security Conference. In February, he explicitly noted that Republicans would continue to strongly support Ukraine. And he said, if you look at the key leaders on Congress, in Congress, on both sides, the House of Representatives and the Senate, they are, uh, for the Republican Party, they are all strong pro-NATO, pro-ally um, Republicans. So, and what he said explicitly, and I think it's important to remember, is that ignore the tur uh, Twitterati, uh, ignore the chatter, ignore the people who get the most likes. Look at the people who are actually doing policy. And I think that's where the United States is. So we should ignore Donald Trump and what is he saying? Well, I'm not telling you to say that. <laughs> what I'm saying is I'm, I'm very confident that the United States will stay the course and continue uh, with our strong alliance with Europe. Major topic in Central Europe nowadays is George Soros for many years now. Mm -hmm. um, has um, He has indeed reinvested hundreds of millions uh, in support of democracy through his foundation. Of mm -hmm. course, it's legitimate. He can do whatever he wants with his money. But from your perspective, does George Soros influence politics in Slovakia? No, I think what George Soros is trying to do, what the Open Society Foundation is trying to do, um, is to support democracy, to support um, the freedoms that uh, we now almost take for granted. You have to remember that George Soros uh, survived the Holocaust. Um, he escaped communism. And for him, growing up in America, he became a very successful businessman, but he saw what had happened uh, in Hungary, which was his homeland, happened uh, behind the Iron Curtain. And he firmly believed that it was important for us to support democracy and rule of law and to support and to make sure that we don't take our freedoms for granted. That's what he's tried to do with uh, his programs and the, uh, and the money that he's provided. Uh, we have a relationship with the Open Society Foundation and it's very much along those same lines that we are strongly support of uh, ensuring that we have a vibrant democracy in the United States, but also that this is uh, continues in Central Europe and throughout the world. You know, there's a, 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 you know, with George Soros, it's, it's unfortunate what's happened because he's, I think, done a tremendous amount of good. Um, my barber, uh, you know, I, he, I was seeing him a few weeks ago. And he was talking about how George Soros was in country. And then he started telling me all these, uh, frankly speaking, crazy stories about what he had heard. This was the uh, importance of disinformation. And then I started asking him, like, where did he, where he heard, had heard this? And then telling him a little bit about George Soros, about his background. And the fact, like, take simple, simple things that he's done. You know, the fact that, you know, it was a Soros scholarship that provided Viktor Orban the opportunity to get a master's degree uh, in England. And it really helped him become uh, a democratic leader back in the 1980s. Um, and uh, he was surprised. He didn't know that uh, the work that George Soros had done. And what's happened is, unfortunately, is the power of disinformation, that um, people hear these negative things about him and about open society, but ignore what open society has actually done. Well, this is what is Robert Fico doing, because he's mentioning George Soros on and on and on last week's. So why George Soros? You know, he's I, 92 years old. Yeah. He used to like help Slovakia, especially in the yeah. 90s, but nowadays he's like pretty old and the yeah. foundation works without him anyways. So I'd have to ask, I'd have to leave that to Mr. Fico. You'd have to ask him why he's focusing on him. What I would say is Mr. Fico's wrong if he's attacking George Soros and he's attacking the Open Society uh, Foundation. Um, Again, what this is about is, is strengthening democracy, ensuring that Slovakia and ensuring that um, we don't, uh, you know, that we don't fail ourselves, that we continue to be strong uh, members of democracy, which means uh, of a democratic country, which means that we all have a responsibility to ensure that democracy functions. You've mentioned the um, attacks on uh, President Chaputova. Uh, how do you see her decision, this decision not to run again for president? 
you know, that's for, of course, President Chaputova to, to decide, and the next president will again be a decision for uh, the Slovak people. What I can say is that uh, President Chaputova has been uh, a, a fantastic ally, uh, has been a strong supporter of transatlantic unity. I think at a very, very important time, she's played a very strong role in um, Slovakia. She became president, of course, after the terrible murders of uh, Jan Kuciak and his fiancée, Martina Kuchnarova. And I think what she provided was a symbol of integrity, of uh, someone who was a moral compass. And I think she maintained that role throughout a very difficult time period. There was COVID. There was a massive inflation. There's, of course, the war next door in Ukraine, uh, Russian disinformation, energy shocks. And I think she's continued to provide that strong leadership that was very important for Slovakia during this time period. Mm. Has your security worsened in any way after the claims that President Chap President Chaputova is an American agent and you can see the anti-Americanism? Uh, so are you receiving any threats? Is it got it worse? Uh, nothing that I'm aware of. I found Slovakia to be a very warm and welcoming place. Uh, I think it's extremely unfortunate that she has suffered these types of threats. Uh, as I said, I think it's incredibly inappropriate for politicians to attack people in personal terms. Um, I think this is a problem across the board. It's not just a Slovak problem, it's a global problem. If you disagree about policy, talk about policy. Tell, say why the other person's wrong. But to create a hostile environment where someone feels that their life is in uh, danger or their children are in danger, that, that's, that's not a society that I think we any of us want to live in. Yeah, indeed. Because according to surveys such as Globsec Trends, anti-American sentiments in Slovakia are increasing, mm -hmm. uh, likely influenced by uh, politicians and right-wing extremists. Uh, but according to Globsec Trends, support for NATO membership has dropped from 72% to 58% in Slovakia, and the majority of people no longer attribute to main responsibility for the war in Ukraine to Russia. Mm -hmm. uh, and 50%, 50, consider the USA a security threat. Mm -hmm. That is quite serious if half of Slovaks uh, believe that America is a threat and that America is responsible for the conflict in Ukraine, doesn't it? Yeah, it is, uh, it is problematic. And I think this is where, again, Russian disinformation has just been very, very effective. And they are very good at this. You know, uh, the Kremlin talking points are disseminated, particularly by the Russian embassy here, which is one of the most prolific disseminators of lies in all of Europe. And it does get picked up. They have their influencers, they have their channels in Telegram, on Facebook, other social media. And they you know, they're, they're able to feed into this false narrative. Uh, and that's absolutely problematic. What I would note is that some of this, um, you know, uh, is uh, both U.S. favorability as well as NATO favorability really went up after the war started. Um, and it, this is a little bit of reverting to where um, our numbers were pre-war, uh, but that is also problematic. Like, why do Slovak people sometimes believe this? Where is this historical tendency to um, have this sympathy uh, for Russia? I don't know, but what I do know is this. Again, Slovakia made some very strong choices to be part of NATO, to be part of the West, and I think Slovakia will continue to be. I think what, uh, what happens uh, here is that you know, the, these, these uh, uh, influences have reached people, but I think people's lives are significantly better than they were prior to the fall of the Iron Curtain. And I think if people have a choice today, they would still choose to be in the West. Do you believe that Russia finances any parties, any politicians in Slovakia? That I don't know. And, you know, I leave that to Slovak authorities to uh, look into all of that and any types of allegations. What I am confident of, absolutely confident of, is that um, Russia uh, does, uh, does provide a great deal of disinformation in Slovakia, as they do throughout Europe, as they do in the United States, and that they're very, very effective at it, and they use these network of influencers. And this is a, uh, this is extremely problematic. So in other words, Russia does finance campaigns, trolls, 
undermining of democracy through disinformation channels. That I, uh, that I think the United States is very confident about, that they've continued to do this throughout the world mm -hmm. and that they continue to do this in the United States. Now, in terms of financing parties, I don't know, but in terms of disseminating falsehoods and disseminating disinformation, absolutely. And that they have a wide network of people who they use and who are probably on the Kremlin payroll. Mm -hmm. Well, you served as the political advisor uh, in Iraq from 2003 to 2004. In 2003, the USA invaded Iraq. Mm -hmm. 20 years later, was the invasion of Iraq a mistake? You know, I think um, it, it, this is one where I, I think we look back and there was a lot of good that came of it, but there was also a lot of uh, uh, unfortunate uh, elements to it. Part of it was that um, so what what's the good? People may sit that back and say, that hey, what's, 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 yeah. what's good? Well, you have to remember what Saddam Hussein was like, and it's very easy to forget after 20 years. This is a man who had uh, gassed his own people in 1988 in Halabja. He had used weapons of uh, uh, chemical weapons against the Kurdish people. Uh, he launched uh, an unprovoked war against uh, Iran in 1980, which uh, resulted in brutal deaths on both Iran and the uh, Iraqi side. Uh, uh, he bombed his own people after 91, uh, both uh, the Shia had uh, rose up uh, in protest and he used his military to suppress it, including bombing uh, his own people. So this was a pretty awful human being. And removing that and allowing Iraqis to choose their own governments, which they have done repeatedly since then, to choose their own way forward, I think has been substantially, uh, it, it's a huge improvement of where they were. And if you look at any sort of social economic indicators from where Iraq was uh, to where they are now, they've made a lot of uh, improvements. Part of the challenges, of course, was that Iraq was a very complicated society uh, because it had been created uh, post-World War I by the British and French, sort of glomming together elements of the Ottoman Empire. And so it took time, I think, for the Iraqi people to have formed a, a nation that I think uh, is as strong as it is today. Okay, but you started the war because of false intelligence on weapons of mass destruction. Opponents of the war argued that the USA did not make a good faith error, mm -hmm. uh, but they sorted the case to sell war they wanted to wage. Well, I think Colin Powell in particular has looked back on that. He talked about this uh, later on, that he felt that uh, the information that we had at the time was not correct. Uh, I think at this point, it's it's... It, it's hard to relitigate re all of that. Um, I, th I, I will leave that to the historians. Uh, what I think is important is where Iraq is headed. And today, the United States and, uh, and Iraq have a very good relationship. The Iraq, uh, the Iraqi people have repeatedly selected their own government, and I'm hopeful for the future tra trajectory. The past, I'm going to have to sort of leave to the historians to decide uh, what was successful and what was not. Yeah, well, it's... 300,000 people dead, right? That's, just, that, 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 that's the aftermath of the, of the war in Iraq, right? It, you know, I, I don't have the figures uh, directly with me, that I, so I'll accept your figure. I would, again, note the number of people that Saddam had killed under his own rule, which I believe was over a million. Um, and I don't want to sit there and say that any war is justified and you looking at the numbers and whatnot, I mean, to, to try to make those balances. At this point, we're in 2023. Uh, what happened 20 years ago happened. So I'll have to leave it to the historians, as I said, to determine um, uh, the truth, to determine, uh, to do that type of analysis. What I think is important as a diplomat, uh, as, a, as an American official today, is how do we make Iraq stronger? How do we help the Iraqi people? And how do we improve uh, the trajectory of democracy in the Middle East? Let's go to Bratislava. The topic of the fence on Hvezdoslav Square mm -hmm. is significant, significant for uh, many people in Bratislava. The USA says um, it is relocating its embassy mm -hmm. uh, and the new building should be the Allianz building that is not far away from the center. How far along is this step? What should we expect? We're still working on the progress. Uh, let me begin by saying I really I want to thank the people of Bratislava. I want to thank the government uh, for your historical support. I realize that this is uh, 
an important place in the center of the city um, that uh, this is a little bit of an eyesore and we appreciate all the support that we have gotten historically. Um, the reason we have the fence is because unfortunately many U.S. diplomatic facilities have been attacked in the past, including uh, in 1998 uh, in Dar es Salaam in uh, Tanzania and in Nairobi in Kenya, people pulled up car bombs right next to the embassy because there were no fences and massive car bombs exploded, killing hundreds of people in both of those embassies. Yeah, well, but this is yeah. Europe. This is not Africa or Asia, right? But in, in a way, it's almost uh, more dangerous. If you think back uh, to the attack in Nice, uh, if you think back to the attack in Brussels, number of attacks, uh, the attack in Paris, this is the Schengen zone. Anyone can go anywhere. There's no checks. And people are allowed, someone can come in in Spain, drive a truck bomb all the way across. Uh, and what I'm saying is, unfortunately, this is the reality of the world we live in. And that's why I'm so grateful for the support uh, that we've received from the Slovak people. And I don't want to make this like a terrible situation, but we have to unfortunately uh, plan for the worst. In terms of the, our, our plans for the future, we are working with the, the city on finalizing the purchase of a land, and then we'll begin construction. My hope is that it will happen sooner rather than later, and that we'll have a facility which will actually be terrific, uh, which will allow for um, us to meet our security needs, but also, I think, uh, provide a very nice space for Slovaks, and then we can uh, take down oh, that fence. In five years, seven years, 10 years, what should we expect? See, I can't give you an answer. Do you know why? Because we have to finalize the agreement with the city first on the land, and then we have to get the money from Congress. Okay, but it will not happen in the next two years, probably. It won't happen in the next yeah. year, okay. year or two, okay. because uh, there, there is still uh, a lot of work that needs to be done. Do you also perceive that Slovaks are racist? We have a deep problem with racism towards Roma, a minority, and some people here truly live in medieval conditions mm -hmm. in Slovakia. Do you feel that? Well, you know, again, that's not for me to say. My interactions with the Slovak people have been wonderful across the board. What I will say is that there are issues that exists in Slovakia with, uh, with um, the Roma uh, in particular, uh, with other minority groups, which I think Slovakia is working on and needs to continue working on. I've met with uh, the Roma community quite a bit. I've visited um, uh, you know, places uh, where, where Roma live out in the eastern part of the country. So I've you've met been with, to some settlements? I've been to some settlements. It's I've quite been. horrible to see, right? Well, so again, I, I think this is, um, from my perspective, visiting with the Roma, visiting where people live, I've had multiple meetings with uh, Mr. Jan Hero, is how we, the United States, can help um, Slovakia, how we can help the Roma community. But this is something absolutely I think Slovakia can do more on, and I stand ready, and the United States stands ready to help Slovakia with this effort. When asked about the biggest cultural difference between the USA and Slovakia, you mentioned uh, being surprised by the high level of pessimism <laughs> among Slovaks. How do you explain that? Why are we so pessimistic? I don't know. Uh, so I think what uh, the thing about the American character, which you always hear, is like Americans are always very optimistic. Uh, if I'm going to be honest, I think sometimes we don't have a very good uh, grasp of history. So we can forget about what happened yesterday and sort of focus on tomorrow. But that is part of the character. And maybe that comes from being an immigrant nation, right? People, uh, uh, you know, take upon great adversity to leave their country, maybe go to a country where they don't speak the language. And there's something about that whole process, which is premised on hope and optimism, that tomorrow my world will be better than it is today. And that's sort of been the essence of what America has always been. I'm not really sure, because from my perspective, what's going on and why Slovaks may be more pessimistic, because I think this is a wonderful country, and I believe you made incredible progress over the last 30 years. You look where Slovakia was in 1993, 1989, and then, of course, you were always part of some sort of empire or grouping before that, and you have done so well for yourself. It's incredible that we survived, right? Well, it's then, incredible yeah. that you survived. And you've also survived some serious democratic challenges. People look back at the Mitchiar period in 1998. Um, people look back after 2018, after the murders again of Kutsiak and Kushnarova, and Slovaks have stepped up and you supported your institutions and you've made for yourselves an amazing country. And for me as an outsider, I can come here and say, wow, this place is great. But I can see sometimes, and I completely
completely understand people living here, especially, again, over the last few years, we've dealt with COVID. Uh, we're dealing with massive inflation. Slovakia had over 15% in, uh, inflation over the last uh, couple of years. Food prices have gone up. Energy prices have gone up. You have a war next door. So I understand also why people are pessimistic. But again, from my perspective coming in as an outsider, I think you guys are doing so well. I'm very, very optimistic about where your country is headed. Um, I think you have amazing young people. Uh, the talent in this country is fantastic. So that's why I'm so optimistic about Slovakia. Well, that was uh, my last question. Many call uh, these elections crucial and groundbreaking. Yeah. Uh, they are considered some of the toughest in Slovakia, uh, and they probably will mean a lot. Um, uh, do you also perceive that these elections are as crucial as described by many, common, uh, many, many journalists and many politicians? So I think every election is crucial, right? I mean, and I think we've seen this in the United States. Um, where sometimes people aren't as invested in election, but every election is, uh, is, is absolutely crucial because you'll determine who your politicians will be for the next four years and you don't know what the world might bring. Um, and so maybe especially now because of what's going on in Ukraine, because of global uncertainty, I can see why people might think these are extremely important. My recommendation to the Slovak people is go vote. Invest in your democracy, because I think uh, that's one of the important things that we have in the West is our freedom. But freedom requires us being responsible citizens. That means uh, we take responsibility, you know, we go out and vote, we find out, we, we learn about the issues, and we get engaged with our governance. Thank you very much, Ambassador Rana, that you were here. I appreciate it. Thank you so much, Susanna. Thank you. Ak chcete podporiť kvalitný obsah, ale aj naše videá, najlepšie urobíte, ak si predplatíte denník SME na sme.sk lomka predplatné. A ak chcete, aby vám na budúce žiadne nové video neušlo, stačí, keď nám dáte na našom YouTube kanáli denník a SME odber a zapnete si upozornenie. Ďakujeme.